Dr. Robert Vinoy, Exodus to Exile, Lecture 7b. We're down to C under Roman numeral 3, which is, quote, The Conquest of Canaan, Joshua 5.13 to 12.24, end quote. One under that is, quote, The Conquest of Jericho in Joshua 6, end quote. I'm sure you're all familiar with the story of the taking of Jericho. It was certainly a very unusual and miraculous way in which the Lord gave the city to Israel. I think the significance of the way in which Israel took Jericho is that this is the first city in the land of Canaan that they took, and the way that it was done was intended by the Lord to give a clear example to them that they would receive the land as a gift from his hand, and that ultimately the land belonged to the Lord, not to Israel. You'll notice in chapter 6, in the second verse, the Lord says, quote, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. End quote. The taking of Jericho was not the result of military strategy, overpowering force, or a long siege. But the city was given into the hands of the Israelites by God when the Israelites obeyed what might have seemed to be rather senseless and odd instructions. You'll notice in verse 3, they are told, quote, March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, March around the city seven times, with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have all the people give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse, and the people will go up, every man straight in. End quote. So you march around the city once each day for six days. And then on the seventh day, you march around it seven times, and blow the trumpets and shout, and the wall of the city's going to fall. But that's exactly what happens. Look at verse 20. Quote, when the trumpet sounded, the people shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the people gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So every man charged straight in, and they took the city. End quote. But what you find is that the people are told that the city is to be possessed only to be devoted to the glory of God. And I think this is equally the case with the rest of the land. You find that explained in chapter 6, verses 17 through 19. There's a translation issue here, which centers around the word harem. You may be familiar with it, but notice verse 17. Quote, the city and all that is in it are to be... End quote. The NIV says, quote, devoted, end quote. That's harem, quote, to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in the house will be spared, because she hid the spies we sent. But keep away from the devoted things. That's the same word, harem. So that you will not bring about your own destruction. Quote, own destruction, end quote is the same word, harem, by taking any of them, end quote. Any of the harem. The word occurs again, quote, otherwise you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction, harem, and bring trouble on it. All the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury, end quote. So the word harem occurs five times in those three verses. The basic idea of harem is to set something apart from personal use to be devoted to the Lord. That can be done in two ways, either by being destroyed or by being put into the treasury of the Lord. In this case, the inhabitants and the cattle were to be killed and destroyed while the gold and the silver were to be put into the treasury of the Lord. Then an additional commandment is given later, at the end of the chapter, where you read, quote, Joshua pronounced this solemn oath, 
Cursed before the Lord is the man who undertakes to rebuild the city Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn son, he will lay its foundations. At the cost of his youngest, will he set up its gates. End quote. I want to make some comments on that, but I miss the importance of Hiram referring to your citations, page 52. Let's go back to that for a minute, just to elaborate a little bit further on it. On page 52 of your citations are two paragraphs from Francis Schaeffer's book, Joshua and the Flow of Biblical History. He says, quote, The city shall be accursed, end quote, quoting from Joshua chapter 6, verse 17. This NIV says, quote, The city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord, end quote. See, that is the word harem again. You may ask, it is, quote, devoted to the Lord, end quote, or accursed, end quote. The translation is different, but that's part of the difficulty of translating the word harem. Schaefer says, quote, accursed, end quote, represents only a part of what this word means. The Hebrew word means both, quote, accursed, end quote, and, quote, devoted, end quote. That is, given to God. Here, it clearly means the latter. The city shall be devoted, which is the way the NIV translates it. Quote, the city and all that is in it are to be to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall be spared, because she hid the spies we sent. End quote. In this way, Joshua gave the command for her protection. Joshua's commands to the people make it absolutely clear that the city was devoted. Quote, but as for you, only keep yourselves from the devoted things, lest when you take of the devoted things, you make the camp of Israel accursed in trouble. But all the silver and gold are holy unto Jehovah. They shall come in unto the treasury of Jehovah. End quote. And then here's Schaefer's comment. Quote, the city of Jericho was a sign of the first fruits. In all things, the first fruits belonged to God. Jericho was the first fruits of the land. Therefore, everything in it was devoted to God. End quote. So there's that additional comment on the devoted thing. But then you get back to that curse at the end of the chapter that Joshua places on anyone who rebuilds this ruined city of Jericho. We find that the city was not rebuilt for a long time. But in 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 34, in the time of Ahab, it was rebuilt. 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 30 says, quote, Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Etbaal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him, end quote. Then it lists some of his evil acts. Quote, he set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole, and he did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than did all the kings of Israel before him, end quote. Then, as almost the climax of his evil acts, you read in verse 34, quote, In Ahab's time, Heel of Bethel rebuilt Jericho. He laid its foundations at the cost of his firstborn son, Aviram, and he set up its gates at the cost of his younger son, Segub, in accordance with the word of the Lord spoken by Joshua the son of Nun, end quote. That's a reference back to what Joshua said in chapter 6, verse 26. Quote, Anybody who rebuilds it will lay the foundations at the cost of his firstborn son and set up its gate at the cost of his youngest son. End quote. Ahab reigned from 874 to 852 B.C. So you're in the 800s when this is fulfilled. The time of the conquests, you know, you go back to that early, late date of the Exodus discussion, either in the 1400s or the 1200s. If you're in the 1200s, 
That's a 400-year period of time. If you go for the earlier date, which I am inclined to think it is, that would mean that the city was not rebuilt for 600 years. You may wonder why the Lord placed that curse on anyone who would rebuild the city of Jericho. That's never been explained in the biblical text, so any explanation we might give is inferred. It seems to me that what the Lord intended was for those ruined walls of the city of Jericho to remain as ruined walls in perpetuity, in order to be a monument to the fact that Israel received the land by God's grace. They marched around that town and the walls fell down. Remember, the Lord had told Joshua, quote, Get those twelve stones as a memorial, end quote, to the way in which he delivered them across the Jordan River by drying up the water. It seems to me that this is another memorial. The ruins of the walls of Jericho are a reminder that when Israel came into the land of Canaan, they received that land as a gift from God. It's not their military might that's going to get them the land of Canaan. So he wanted those walls as a perpetual testimony to the fact that, quote, this is my land, I am giving it to you, end quote. He didn't want the walls rebuilt or the gates rebuilt. Ahab, I think, as a ruler who turned away from the Lord, was not a true covenantal king. He was not a king who found his security by following the Lord, walking in obedience to the Lord, and claiming the Lord's promise for protection of the nation. He did not feel that this open city, that is, a city without walls, on the southeastern frontier of the northern kingdom, was a strength, but rather a liability. We know from some extra-biblical information that at the time that Ahab was threatened by Mesha, king of Moab, Mesha took a city called Medaba, which was right across the Jordan from the city of Jericho. It seems that Ahab felt a liability in that southeastern frontier of the northern kingdom and decided, quote, I need to refortify that city in order to keep the security for the northern kingdom, end quote. But he did so at the cost of Hiel, of Bethel's firstborn son, as well as his youngest son. So those comments about the taking of the city of Jericho. I want to make a few comments about archaeological finds that relate to this chapter. We discussed this to some extent when we talked about the date of the Exodus. Jericho comes into that discussion because Garstang said the walls of Jericho fell around 1400 BC. So it became an argument for the early date of the Exodus. The mound of Jericho is a very well-defined mound. There is no problem about the site identification. If you go east from Jericho down the Jordan Valley, Jericho is, to this day, a very visible site. It's about 10 miles northwest of where the Jordan River enters the Dead Sea. We can picture the map where the Jordan River flows into the Dead Sea. Right about 10 miles northwest of that is this mound. About a mile west of the site of Jericho, there's a ridge about 1,500 feet high that goes up into the highlands of the central part of the land of Canaan. That western ridge of the Rift Valley is cut by gorges that give access into the center of the land of Canaan. Jericho is of strategic significance because it guards the entrance into those passes that lead out into the central highlands. There was a good water source there. There was good soil, and it was in a strategic location, recognized very early as having enormous significance. Excavations were begun on the mound in the early 1900s by the Germans, under a man named Ernest Sellen. And he worked on the mound for several years, from 1907 to 1909. In the 1930s, an Englishman named John Garstang worked further on the mound. Then in the 1950s, Kathleen Kenyon, also English, did further excavations on Jericho. What the Germans and Garstang and Kenyon all found out was that this site had a very long history. The oldest tower found dates about 
9000 B.C., from the Neolithic Stone Age. My wife and I visited Jericho some years ago. We drove down from Jerusalem. When you get to the outskirts of the modern site, the ancient site off to the side of the modern site, there's a sign when you come into Jericho that says, quote, the oldest town on earth, end quote. That may be an exaggeration, but not by much. It's a site that has a history going back to 9000 B.C., which is pretty unique. The excavation showed that in the early Bronze Age, about 3000 to 2000 B.C., it was a very important walled city. Just to give you an idea of the setting, that parallels the time of the Pyramid Age in Egypt. If you get down to the latter part of the Bronze Age, this is the same as Ur of the Chaldees and the third dynasty of Ur, where Abraham was from southern Mesopotamia. So it was an important city at that time. It was destroyed between 2300 and 2000 BC. We don't know exactly who the agent of that destruction was. But I might say here that the walls of that period in time were ones that Garstang initially thought were from the time of Joshua. His view was later revised. In the Middle Bronze Age, from 2000 to 1500, you again get a well-built city with strong walls. It grew to the greatest size it ever attained. You're now in the Patriarchal Period, from 2000 to 1500 B.C., as far as what's going on in the land of Canaan. At the end of the Middle Bronze, it again was violently destroyed, and again you wonder who the agent of destruction was. We don't know. Some people used to speculate it was the Hyksos. The Hyksos were prominent rulers of Egypt for a period of time, and they were driven out of Egypt about 1570 B.C. They ruled in Egypt from about 1750 down to 1570, but about 1570 they were driven out of Egypt. Where did they go? Did they come up into the land of Canaan? Possibly. Did they attack Jericho? It's possible. But we're not certain. But again, it was destroyed at the end of the Middle Bronze Age. In the Late Bronze Age, which is the period that interests us, being the time of the Book of Joshua, the city was again occupied. However, from what the archaeologists tell us, there's very little left on the mound from that period of time. Garstang had argued that the city had been destroyed about 1400 B.C. in that late Bronze Age. Kathleen Kenyon contested that and spoke of, quote, a tremendous denudation of the upper strata of the mound from this period of time, end quote. It seems that a lot of this level was eroded away during that 400 to 600 year period when the city was largely uninhabited after it had fallen to Joshua, between Joshua and Ahab. It was, for all intents and purposes, an uninhabited site during that time. Now look at your citations on page 51. James Kelso, in his Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible article on Jericho, says, quote, in 1952, Kathleen Kenyon began a work on the mound. After five years of her work, the archaeological picture is clearer, and the following conclusions now seem valid. Most of the mound is 16th century B.C. or earlier. Indeed, the major depth of the mound is mainly Neolithic, end quote. In other words, most of the mound belongs to prehistoric times, and the last big city was something of 300 years earlier than Moses. Unfortunately, she has found that the small amount of the upper levels which had escaped destruction by wind and rain were those areas already worked by the Germans and Garstang. Quote, Jericho was built of mud brick, and this quickly disintegrates by wind and rain. The same winds which furnished the draft for Solomon's smelters at Ezion Geber had already blasted their way through the mud bricks of Jericho. One year, the English excavations were flooded by heavy rains. Even in the Neolithic era, stream 
channels were found cutting into parts of the mound. Therefore, it seems unlikely that anything new can be learned of 13th century Jericho from the mound itself, although nearby tombs might prove very helpful in the future. End quote. Then notice this last sentence, quote, One of the major tragedies of Palestinian archaeologies is that the Germans excavated Jericho when archaeology was still an infant science, end quote. The Germans got in there in the early 1900s and disturbed this area of the mound before methods had been developed for excavation. So this information is lost. Go down to the next paragraph, a paragraph there from Kenyon on page 51 of your citation. She says, quote, Occupation of the site started in the Mesolithic period. There was a continuous development in that stage in the town of the pre-pottery Neolithic period of 8000 BC. Successfully occupied by two different groups of people, whereafter there was a very lesser occupation by Neolithic people at that time. Late in the fourth millennium, there was continuous occupation until the town was destroyed. End quote. Notice her dates here. Quote, about 1580, it was probably reoccupied about 1400 BC. From the time of this period, almost nothing remained. End quote. Now we talk about this when we talked about Jericho earlier. If you take John Bimson's thesis in his book redating the Exodus conquest, then he moves the dating of archaeological periods. I'm pretty sure at the end of the, that Middle Bronze Age down into the next century, into the 1400s. That would move that 1580 destruction level down, say, to 1400. Then you're pretty close to that early period of the Exodus based on 1 Kings 6.1. So that debate, as I've mentioned before, is an ongoing thing. If Kenyon is correct about the 1580 date being a destruction level, and then you link her 1580 date with Bimson's revision of the dates of archaeological periods, it fits with an early date theory. However, as I mentioned earlier, Bryant Wood has come into the picture more recently. I gave you that handout on Jericho with a summary of this BAR, Biblical Archaeology Review, article in your bibliography. Going back into Kenyon's own excavation reports, he argues that there's good evidence that the city was destroyed in the 1400s and that her dating is wrong there. So the debate goes on. Let me just read you one other quotation here. Look at page 53. It applies to... Another thing we're going to come to in a minute, but look at the middle of page 53, quote, Biblical Exodus redating is flawed, end quote, in BAR, or Biblical Archaeology Review, since 1987. Hugh Calperon is arguing here against Bimson's redating of the Middle Bronze Age, moving the date down. He says, quote, the biblical account of the conquest was written late in the 7th century B.C., end quote. In other words, in the 600s, very late, quote, and fails to link the conquest to any events that external sources permit us to date. So, by taking elementary precautions against skepticism about the biblical text, by pressing one's eyelids down tightly on the cheekbone, one can pretend that the book of Joshua is the unvarnished, untarnished truth, and that it all occurred in the 15th century B.C. Israel conquered Canaan in a single decisive campaign. But B and L, end quote. Now, B and L were Bimson and Livingston. David Livingston is someone who bought into Bimson's redating of the archaeological period, so he says, quote, what B and L have done is to afford unquestioning credulity to their own highly idiosyncratic reading of the conquest of Canaan. B and L's smorgasbord approach is attractive because it masquerades as a defense of the Bible, but it is not. B and L dismiss much biblical evidence. In the end, they embrace picking and choosing. 
They're textually, arbitrary, historically unconvincing, archaeologically improbable hypothesis hides its warts behind a veneer of benevolent piety. Piety has its benefits, no doubt, but it also has its price, and the going price for B&L's piety is about 200 years of Israelite history, unquote. That's his debate. Now, I read that paragraph just to show you the kind of almost vitriolic language that is used against people that attempt to defend the reliability of the conquest stories, the conquest of Jericho. So those are comments on Jericho. Let's move on to a, the attack of I in Joshua chapters 7 and 8. In Joshua chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, you read that Joshua, quote, sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beit Avon, to the east of Bethel, and told them, go up and spy out the region. So the men went up and spied out Ai, and when they returned to Joshua, they said, not all the people have to go up against Ai. Send two or three thousand men. There are only a few men there. End quote. Verse 4, quote, So about three thousand men went up, but they were routed by the men of Ai, who killed about thirty-six of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries, and struck them down on the slopes. At this, the hearts of the people melted and became like water. End quote. So they sent that small force up there, because they didn't think there would be significant opposition and they were defeated. Joshua wonders why. You read in verse 6, quote, Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground, and the elders of Israel did the same, end quote. Joshua said in verse 7, quote, Ah, sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring this people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? If only we had been content to stay on the other side of Jordan. End quote. This is after that remarkable crossing. O oh Lord, what can I say now that Israel has been routed by its enemies? The Canaanites and other people of the country will hear about this. They will surround us and wipe out our name from the earth. What then will you do for your own great name? End quote. The Lord's response is, quote, Stand up. What are you doing down on your face? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the cherem, devoted things. They have stolen. They have lied. They have put them with their own possessions. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and run because they have been made liable to destruction. End quote. That's cherem, by the way, liable to destruction. Quote, I will not be with you any more unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. End quote. So you find out that this man Achan had taken from the things that were to be devoted to the Lord, which he had explicitly commanded them not to do. Now look down to verse 20. Achan says, quote, I have sinned against the Lord. This is what I have done. When I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe from Babylonia, two hundred shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing fifty shekels, I coveted them and took them. End quote. So he and his family were taken and stoned, and we read in verse 26, quote, Over Achan they heaped up a large pile of rocks, which remains to this day. End quote. There's another memorial. This time it is a reminder of divine judgment against sin. There was the crossing of the river and the fall of the walls of Jericho. Reminders of God's grace. Now here's a reminder of what happens when you disobey God. So after that, in chapter 8, a new force was taken out and sent up to Ai. And this time they were successful. You read in verse 19b, quote, they entered the city, captured it, and set it on fire. The men of Ai looked back and saw the smoke of the city rising against the sky. End quote. 
we won't go into any of the strategy in order to do that. But they take the city. And you read in verse 25, quote, 12,000 men and women fell that day, all the people of Ai. For Joshua did not draw back the hand that held out his javelin until he had destroyed all who lived in Ai. End quote. Then in verse 28, they, quote, burned Ai and made it a permanent heap of ruins, and he hung the king of Ai on a tree. End quote. Now, this is a case where there's a lot of discussion, again, about the way in which archaeological research relates to the biblical text. In the 1930s, there was a mound that was currently known as, quote, et tel, end quote, that was thought to be the site of Ai, and it was excavated. Those who worked on that mound tell us that the city was destroyed about 2200 B.C. and was not occupied again except for a very small Iron Age cell about 1200 to 1050 B.C. So if this site was not occupied from 2200 down to 1200, that raises problems for correlating those archaeological findings with what we're told in Joshua chapter 7 and 8. That question has been around since the second half of the 20th century and continues to this day there have been various proposals to try to harmonize the archaeological findings with the biblical description. There was a French Old Testament scholar by the name of Vincent who suggested that Etel, or Ai, was a military outpost of Bethel, and that the conquest of Ai was really not the conquest of a city, but the overrunning of a military outpost of Bethel. If it was simply a military outpost of Bethel, you wouldn't expect much evidence left of the occupation of the site. Well, that's an interesting suggestion, because Joshua doesn't say anything about the taking of Bethel. Was I a military outpost of Bethel? I don't think you can harmonize that with the text. If you go to chapter 12, where you have that list of kings taken, you read in verse 9, quote, The king of Ai near Bethel, one, end quote, one king. You go down to verse 16, quote, the king of Bethel, one, end quote. There was a king of Ai, and there was a king of Bethel. It doesn't sound like Ai was a military outpost of Bethel. You will find another suggestion in your citations on page 52. This paragraph is from Finnegan's Light of the Ancient Past. He talks about this problem of harmonizing archaeological data with the biblical account, and he says the most probable explanation is this, quote, The difficulty at this point lies in the confusion between Ai and Bethel. The site of the latter city, that is Bethel, is less than one and a half miles distance from Ai, and is known as Betin, that is to say, in modern site identification, Betin is thought to be Bethel. Excavations were conducted there by joint expeditions by the American Schools of Oriental Research and Pittsburgh Theological Seminary under W.F. Albright and James Kelso. Bethel was found to have been occupied first after the destruction of the Old Bronze Age city of Ai, until it existed as a well-known town sometime in the middle to late Bronze Ages. Sometime in the 13th century, the city was consumed by a tremendous conflagration that left behind solid masses of burned brick, ash, and charred debris. There could be little doubt that this destruction represents the conquest of the city by the children of Israel, end quote. That's a fact. In the next paragraph, he says, quote, it may be noted that in the book of Joshua no account is given of the capture of Bethel, while on the other hand, in the latter account of Judges, the taking of Bethel by the house of Joseph is narrated. But nothing is said of I. Therefore, it may be supposed, end quote, and this is Albright's view and a number of others, quote, that at a latter date the tradition of the sack of Bethel was attached erroneously but naturally, 
to the nearby ruins of Ai, end quote. In other words, how do we deal with the seemingly inconsistency in archaeological findings at Atel and the biblical account of the taking of Ai? Well, whoever wrote this history got the story of the destruction of Bethel confused with the story of the destruction of Ai. What you're really reading in chapters 7 and 8 is about Bethel, not about Ai. Of course, that means the biblical text is not reliable. If you look at page 53 in your citations, both Free and Kitchen, at the bottom of the page, discuss this problem. I think they go in a direction that's the most sensible one. Free says, quote, The recent solution that has been offered in the research of J. Simmons that Attell is not to be identified with Bethel slash I, end quote. In other words, this site identification is the problem. It's the wrong site identification. Attell is not I. So any excavation done at Attell is not telling you anything about I. And, quote, he, that is J. Simmons, offers four objections to this identification. One, Attell was not particularly near Betin or Bethel. Joshua chapter 12 verse 9 indicates that I is beside Bethel. Two, Atel is a large site, whereas Joshua 3 describes the people as few. Three, Atel was not a ruin in the post-conquest period, whereas Joshua indicates I was. And four, there's no broad valley to the north of Atel with Joshua 11, in case they missed the men of Joshua's troops. End quote. So Free is arguing for a faulty site identification. If Atel is not to be identified with I, then the indication that Atel was not in existence in 1400 BC has no bearing on the biblical history. Or if Vincent's suggestion that I was a fortress in which little or nothing remains is correct, Again, the biblical narrative offers no difficulty. But it does offer difficulty with the mention of a king of Ai and a king of Bethel. So, he says, quote, In view of such possible solutions, it's inadvisable to insist the Bible must be wrong, end quote. K.A. Kitchen is very similar at the bottom of the page. He says, quote, Excavations at Atel have failed to produce any proper evidence of occupation there after the early Bronze Age, apart from a small Israelite settlement in 1200 to 1050. The site assertion sometimes creates controversy. This situation suggests Atel is not I, but another ancient site, perhaps Beit Avon, and that I must be looked for somewhere else in the area near Atel. I might say there is a pretty serious problem with this kind of site identification. There are mounds all over the land of Canaan. There are no signposts saying, quote, this was this or that ancient city, end quote. You have all these mounds. You dig into them, and there's a lot of rubble. You read about places in the Bible. How do you connect the biblical place name with some mound? It's not an easy business. Albright, way back in the 1920s and 30s, rode around Canaan on a donkey and made site identifications. Quote, well, this is this site, that is that, Bethel is there, end quote. And many times he had good reasons to make them. But in many cases he identified them incorrectly. Kitchen says, quote, when mounds and literary records fail to agree, in other cases topographers and archaeologists do not panic, but simply use their common sense and recognize they are probably mistaken in their identification and proceed to search elsewhere in the region. The problem of I should be regarded in exactly the same way. Jericho and I are lessons in negative evidence. The absence of the expected body of remains of the late Bronze Age date does not automatically imply that the biblical narratives are mistakes of an ideological tale, end quote. Kitchen's dictum is, quote, 
Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, end quote. Just because you don't have the evidence you might wish to have doesn't mean the biblical text or some other text is necessarily wrong. Quote, the circumstantial realism of topographical illusions and of Joshua's leadership suggest otherwise, as does the analogy of archaeological failure to produce remains coordinating with other indisputable ancient evidence or written documents. End quote. Now, since Kitchen and Free made those comments about site identification, a man named David Livingston began investigating this. You will find some entries in your bibliography under this heading. Look on page 12, in the middle of the page, in your bibliography. Livingston wrote an article in the Westminster Theological Journal in 1970 entitled, quote, The Location of Biblical Bethel and I Reconsidered, end quote. Then another article, a year later, quote, Traditional Site of Bethel Questioned, end quote. And another article in 1994, quote, Further Consideration on the Location of Bethel at Albira, end quote. What Livingston does in those articles is suggest that we need a new site identification, not just for I, but also for Bethel. The traditional view was that Bethel was Betin, and I was Atel. Livingston makes a case, with lots of arguments and evidence that I don't want to get into, that we should locate both of those to a different sites. He suggests that Bethel is perhaps at the site Albira, instead of Betin, and that I is either here at Kribbet el Maktir or Kribbet el Bira. If you look at the map, you can see that Betin is here. Albira is here. So you see those sites are all in pretty close proximity to each other. The question remains, which mound is which site? On the excavations, I would like to make just a couple of quick comments. From the excavations that Livingston has done up to this point at Kribbet Nisia, as I, he has found that occupation of that site ceased about the time of the transition from the Middle Bronze to the Late Bronze Age. In other words, you're there at that 1500 period. And again, if you go over that 1500 period, as Bimson argues, it would fit. Bryant Wood, who wrote that article about Jericho, has been excavating in recent years at the other site, El Makatir. He has come up with some very interesting findings. He found that at El Makatir has a fortified site dating to the time of Joshua in the 1400s. It's the only fortified site in that Late Bronze Age. Late Bronze Age is 1500 to 1200 BC. It's the only fortified site of the Late Bronze Age between Jerusalem and Shechem that has been discovered so far. Now Shechem is way to the north. So this was a significant site, and he is continuing to excavate there. It will be interesting to see what he comes up with, but it certainly is a possibility. And if evidence turns up that maybe this is I, it could solve the problem. On the other issue of changing the traditional location of Bethel from Betin to Albira, the interesting thing at Betin is... In excavations done there, they've never found evidence for the high place that was constructed by Jeroboam I. After the division of the kingdom, he put up an altar at Bethel and another at Dan. They've never found evidence of that. No excavations have been done at Bira. So there's a site that also may prove interesting to see, if it is ever excavated in the future. The problem is political. Bira is a Palestinian town on the West Bank. The highest point of the town, which would presumably be the place to look for Jeroboam's high place, is the site of the house of the mayor of the town, who is Palestinian. So I don't think there's going to be any excavating at Bira in the future. But this question of I and how you relate the archaeological findings to the biblical accounts of Joshua's taking of I is, 
is certainly an ongoing question. Well, we're out of time. We'll have to pick up here next time. Dr. Robert Vinoy, Exodus to Exile, Lecture 7b.